This is Extra Paycheck Podcast, episode number 67. You're listening to Extra Paycheck Podcast, where you will learn how to build and grow your own successful online business. Now, here's your host, Alex Soul. Welcome to yet another episode of Extra Paycheck Podcast. This is episode number 67 and today's special guest is from Montreal. His name is Ambrose. He's an entrepreneur, a growth hacker and an event organizer. Great show is ahead of you so enjoy today's episode. Hi Ambrose and welcome to the Extra Paycheck Podcast. Hi Alex, thanks for having me. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself and what is that you do um, as, as a business, as the main activity that we're here to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So I was born in Germany and then moved in England and uh, all around France. And when I was 18, I uh, decided to come study in Montreal. So I studied business in, uh, at HSC Montreal, specifically uh, marketing and, uh, and IT. Then, uh, then I studied at a, I did a master's degree, work at a startup, and now I'm a uh, full-time job is, uh, to, uh, growth hacker and, and uh, product owner at Yellow Pages. So basically, I work on mobile apps and websites, uh, work with uh, developers, and try to make those websites and app grow. Uh, something I do it on the side is, uh, as you said, MTL plus e-commerce, which I think we'll talk more specifically tonight. So MTL plus e-commerce is the, the biggest monthly e-commerce event in North America. Uh, we started it three years ago. It's a nonprofit, and we have around 150 to 200 attendees per event. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell us a little bit more then about these uh, events. You said it's a monthly event, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. What what happens at those events? So those events are um, where the e-commerce co community in Montreal gathers every month. So this initiative was started by uh, Charles Bren. I worked at his startup uh, two years ago, and I got involved. So it started as a very uh, like chill event at bars with developers in e-commerce, and it, uh, it grew to what it is today. Uh, I would say a world-class event. We've been featured in uh, world, uh, world rankings in e-commerce events. We have speakers coming from, uh, from New York oftentimes, and so it's mm -hmm. uh, really well known in uh, Canada and North America, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. And um, so it's to me, it's kind of a big thing, because... If I would want to put up an event of any kind on, on any subject, really, right, I wouldn't know where to begin because to me, this is pretty much, I would say, impossible <laughs> to do as in there is so much that, that comes to mind when setting up an event like that. And I think it, it could be extremely difficult. So maybe you could give us some hints on how an event like that could be set up. Mm -hmm. So the first, uh, the first part is to choose a topic and stick to it. I see too many meetups uh, starting as a startup event and then growing uh, into a photography event, stuff, stuff like that. Uh, then, uh, so obviously, MTL Plus E-commerce is, a, I would say, an old event. We have, uh, we have been doing this for three years, so we have some kind of systems and uh, routines in place. But uh, I would say, stay simple. Um, the format we found works best is having two speakers speak, uh, speak for 20 minutes each and then have a Q&As. Uh, people also come there to network, have a bite, have a drink. So I'd say, uh, yeah, stay simple, stick to your topic and uh, and build upon that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes sense. And I guess the more you do it, the more connections you get, the more um, you just get better at it. As you said, you have systems in place eventually and it's all, uh, it becomes a little bit easier and I guess less chaotic. <laughs> but how, um, what's what would be the proper question here? Uh, well, let's let's look at your event and maybe you could explain why exactly you're doing that event. Because as we just talked about, it does take a lot of time to set it up. It takes a lot of effort. It does. And what, what's the reason for doing these events every single month? Why are you doing that? So when I started doing event, I was a uh, was student uh, at uh, my business school. I wanted to get involved in the uh, student associations and uh, basically every student association organizes events. So that's when I got started with events. I was doing it mainly for uh, networking and growing my, uh, my network here since I'm not from uh, Montreal. Then um, I would say it really helps with uh, personal branding. So if you organize events in a specific industry, soon you'll have a, a, one of the best networks in your industry because people talk about the event, they come, they meet you. 
And uh, this network also follows you on your personal accounts. So when I began helping with MTL Post e-commerce, I had uh, I had a small Twitter account, uh, and then I leveraged Montreal Post e-commerce network to build uh, my personal blog, uh, then my grow my Twitter account. So it's really it's really kind of a deal you make with yourself. You you grow your events month by month, and it also helps you grow your uh, personal branding. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a really good answer, and that's where it becomes a lot more interesting for people, for instance, who are listening to this podcast, because that's a goal for many of us to build our brand, to build our personal brand, to build our um, following online, especially. And an event like that would be a great way to do that. But see, once again, I think there's a difference between doing one event and making them a regular recurring thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. And we talked about uh, personal branding, but uh, I see some uh, some companies doing events. Uh, so there are many ways to leverage events. For instance, we, uh, I know companies who organize monthly meetups. Uh, basically, they, they put their companies as sponsors, they organize the event, and that's their way to uh, to pay back to, to the community, meet everyone, and also to, uh, to find new uh, prospects, new leads. So in every industry, you can have new, uh, new leads led that way. For instance, uh, at the beginning of our events, we uh, introduce our sponsors. Uh, they are paid sponsors, but they do that to have the visibility uh, in our community and mm-hmm. also to, to uh, also online. And you get to you get to have people come you after the event and ask you about your product or your service. That's really great mm-hmm. for them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I'm sure a lot of companies would not even uh, like you said some companies would set up events like that but i'm sure a lot of companies would prefer to partner up with the local event already that already exists and just uh throw some money at you and be <laughs> like can we like you know either promote us or just have us within your event as a sponsor for once again the same thing visibility mm-hmm. another way to do that is to host events so we have uh, we have like five six sponsors so we have paid sponsors for our company and we also have some uh, community sp- sponsors. So they, we don't pay us, they don't pay them, but we promote each other and uh, make sure to build like a, a coherent community around uh, our field. And also, mm-hmm. like I said, uh, you can host uh, events at your place. We try, uh, we basically off- rarely pay for, uh, for a room. We have sponsors hosted, for instance, Shopify in Montreal uh, hosts uh, our event on a regular basis, Lightspeed too. And that's a great way mm-hmm. for them to uh, to have people come to the offices, uh, to recruit people, and uh, really be visible without having to pay since they already have the the venue. Yeah, yeah, that's really awesome. And could you dig maybe a little bit deeper into getting those uh, paid sponsors? How how do you actually get companies to um, to kind of listen to you, to trust you, to trust your event, and how do you approach them before? about getting getting sponsorship from them for your event. So it's all, uh, once again, it's all about network. So in our case, since uh, Charles Brand, who founded the meetup uh, in Montreal, he founded the, the, the restaurant chain Juliette Chocolat. He also had a startup. So he had a kind of a global network, even in the uh, in the US and in France. So it really helped at the beginning. So if you, if you launch an event next month, you won't have PayPal or Shopify as a sponsor. But mm-hmm. you could have some great local sponsors. For instance, we had Cake Mail as a sponsor at the beginning. So they're kind of the, the Montreal-based MailChimp. And then, then you, grow, uh, you grow your sponsors as you grow your events. Uh, they get more interested. Some, uh, some people will be at your event and ask if they can sponsor. And uh, mm-hmm. it's not about having all the, the sponsors you can. We're very selective about sponsors because it, it takes a lot of time. And also, uh, sponsors don't want to be competing with other sponsors. So if we have yeah. an e-commerce agency or a web hosting ag- agency, they don't want to be uh, around other sponsors. Mm, do you mean they don't want to have other sponsors sponsoring the event or they do not want um, other companies who are in the same space as them being also the uh, sponsor of their event? They don't want company in the same field, yeah. Uh-huh. So they're, yeah, they're okay with other companies. Let's say if it's, like you said, the web hosting firm, they're fine with... Uh, having some marketing firm sponsoring your event at the same time. Exactly. Okay. And the big challenge too is to uh, to have them pay you in time. So what I suggest is having having them pay you in advance. For instance, uh, have them uh, sign a contract for six months and uh, and have them pay upfront because otherwise you go you'll jump 
you, you can you can of uh, always contact them to to get the money. It's an issue at the beginning. And also mm-hmm. something great about sponsors is that that not only you uh, they help you at the event, but they also help you find uh, venues and speakers because the people who sponsor events they they go to a lot of events. They have a huge network, uh, international network, and uh, that really uh, that really helps when uh, it comes to time to find a speaker. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and we talked about uh, the the good things, the positive uh, things about creating those events, such as networking and creating more, uh, you know, a contact base of some sort, uh, people who follow you, who like your brand and stuff. But can you actually set up an event and run those kind of events, in your opinion, with a purse? with the purpose of not monetizing your brand, but making money of the event itself. How possible is that? Of course, many people do it. Uh, basically, for uh, for the kind of event we do, we have two sources of income. So we have the, the, spo- the sponsors who mm-hmm. participate to pay the food, the drinks, the venue, if we need to pay. And you also have the, the tickets. So in our case, we have... Uh, we have early bird, t- early bird tickets at uh, $10, and then uh, we switch to $20, uh, which is also the price they pay at the door if uh, if we're not sold out. Mm-hmm. So with those two streams of income, you could uh, you could easily make money uh, off of it. Uh, in our case, we, we, cho- we chose to be a non-profit because uh, this way we say uh, like we stay uh, true to ourselves, not um, not like other events. And also, uh, a good way to, to make money off of it would be to, uh, to do kind of classes, trainings. We did one pilot in, uh, in September. It was a Google Analytics class. It worked mm-hmm. really, really well. And uh, we've known from, uh, for, uh, I think, a year. We've talked about it a lot. We could, uh, basically, one of us could live off, the, off MCL e-commerce if he spent uh, like all his or her time uh, doing that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So basically, if you did that full time, you're you sure that you could easily live off of that only just from the event. Exactly. Okay, cool. So uh, now I want to speak a little bit more about, well, once again, organizing events and stuff. And maybe you could share some strategies of of promoting those events because setting up an event is one thing. And imagine if even if you found some very small local sponsor and it's a company that wants to be involved, but they're small companies, so they don't have a network of, uh, you know, uh, followers, and it's um, it's hard for them to help you advertise and market that event. So pretty much you're stuck alone advertising and marketing that event. And, um, yeah, well, in, in any industry, really. So, uh, yeah, maybe you could give out some tips and hints on how one could advertise that event and to get the most people possible coming to it. Sure, I'd be happy to. So the first part of organizing an event is f- finding your uh, your speakers and sponsors because this defines uh, a new venue, sorry, because this defines the date of your event. And mm-hmm. once you have the date, you can basically uh, begin promoting like uh, like crazy. So it depends also if you're doing a small local event, it's going to be easier to find a small place or and speakers to sp- to to talk there at that time. But uh, if you have like well well known speakers like we had. Uh, Harley Fickelstein from Shopify, who's the COO, it's going to be a bit harder. So mm-hmm. I'd say once you have that, uh, you're good to, to begin promoting. Uh, it's happened that we, we've had only speakers and venue uh, one week or less before the event and still uh, still sold out on tickets. Mm-hmm. So once you have that, uh, if you're beginning, I would say uh, begin with uh, meetup.com and even Bright because those are, um, those are places people come to, uh, to find events like yours. So they have some internal traffic and uh, you won't have to build a website from scratch at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Then uh, for promotion, I'll say social media is a great place to start. So in our case, we leverage Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, even uh, even Periscope. So mm-hmm. Facebook is pretty powerful because you can like easily reach your uh, your network. So you can have a page for event uh, for your um, your event series. You can have an event on Facebook. Which is really powerful since you can uh, you can invite people, and uh, events are, on Facebook are set up in a way that uh, if someone is coming or maybe he'll see your notifications, as opposed yeah. to a Facebook page. So that's uh, that's huge for us. Uh, we also do some ads on Facebook, so very small budgets, but uh, it helps us reach specific people we want to target, and also mm-hmm. you can have them uh, like your page afterwards, which is nice. 
Uh, then on Twitter, mm -hmm. I'll say you can reach out to, to people you know who are uh, influencers in your industry. So just tag them in a post, ask them if they're coming, ask them what they think about the, the topic. You can even begin to gather some questions about uh, the presentations. And then since uh, we're mainly talking about pro events, uh, LinkedIn is also a place to go. So you can post on your personal network, uh, personal account. We have set up a group, a page. And also for social media, uh, ask your sponsors to, to post on their social media. Even if they're small, they, it's gonna bring some people. And uh, your speakers uh, is the same. And also MTL Commerce, we're a team of uh, five people who do that uh, on the side. Uh, but we ask, we uh, we all post the event on our LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and we even ask our volunteers to do so. So that you mm -hmm. that that way you start with a small base of uh, of people. Then uh, of course, if you start with Meetup, you they they have a newsletter system built in, so you can easily uh, reach out to all your members. And uh, also, uh, as you your listeners maybe sure know, the the emails is email is also a powerful way to. Uh, to reach out to people, even if you have your own email list. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> thanks for that. And I think a lot of the things that you mentioned, it, see, it's not event specific. It's pretty much for any business. All of those strategies are really mm, powerful. Mm -hmm. Or, well, if you do them properly, of course, could be very powerful and could bring in the traffic, the money, the people, <laughs> the everything else. Exactly. And so uh, on this, uh, my full-time job is a growth hacker. So uh, it, I think it helped a lot to, to build those, uh, those network and to automate also a lot of stuff. If you're do doing that on your uh, own time, you don't want to spend uh, X hours to, to plan posts on your social media. So you could automate that. If you post a photo on Instagram, you can have it posted on Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. And also mm -hmm. you can set up uh, some uh, automatic posts with your, uh, each time you, po you, you, you have a blog post posted on your website and, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned that term growth hacker, maybe we could go into into growth hacking a little bit. And well, first of all, let's start with with you explaining what growth hacking is for those who might not be familiar with the term. OK, so it's kind of a buzzword. Everybody kind of has their definition of it. But yeah. for me, it's uh, it's all about uh, the product in the end. So you build a good product. People won't come to it. But if you build a uh, product that uh, that encourages people to share to share it with their uh, their connections, their friends, family, then you have better chances of um, of having it grow. Uh, also, many people think of growth hacking as a, a set of tools, uh, some tricks that can have uh, increase your uh, conversion rate by 0.5 percent. But uh, in my opinion, it's more about creating systems about around your product or websites and uh, automations, like I just said. So that you can mm -hmm. really focus on what's uh, important for you. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could give us some real life examples of growth hacking that you have done personally to help you either grow an event or grow your brand or uh, anything really. Mm -hmm. So a simple one is uh, with MTL e-commerce uh, accounts. So on Twitter, we uh, I have set up uh, if this, then that and buffer in a way that uh, when Shopify posts a blog post on the blog, it automatically, automatically gets posted on our Twitter. So it saves us a lot of time during the event. Also, um, during the event, you don't want to be posting all, well, all over on social media. So usually we mm -hmm. have a, a volunteer who does that. But uh, you, could, you could simplify uh, his or her life with uh, automations. Uh, with, for instance, uh, when you do a Periscope, uh, make sure that it's posted on Twitter, uh, and Twitter Facebook, uh, all your accounts, basically. Mm -hmm. That yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's I I guess in your case in your specific industry and what you do, growth hacking is pretty much getting the most value of your actions by um, by automation, by simplifying things, by I guess batching things, mm -hmm. just getting more results out of the same effort in a way. Exactly, and also finding what your customer really like and uh, want in your product. Yeah, I guess that's the um, that's the golden nugget kind of. I think that's <laughs> that's the the secret to success. Yeah. You could you could spend you know years building a software or whatever product of any kind and to only find out after two years that nobody wants your software or that you know it's just not quality's not there. So <laughs> it's it's really not the 
I mean, the, the actual point is finding out what people want and giving that to them, not what you think they want. Exactly. Being uh, lean as possible and uh, testing everything uh, on the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I've, I've been looking at uh, another research that you just mentioned, if this, then that. Uh, that thing could be <laughs> incredibly interesting. And I just started <laughs> using it not too long ago for one of the examples I'm using it for. Um, when I post a picture on a very specific Instagram account, I use if this, then that to automatically repost that picture on the Facebook page for that, for like the same brand or the same, the same account in a way. And a lot of people told me that, oh, it's easy. Like you shouldn't do that on, on Instagram. It's super easy. You just click on share and you set up your Facebook account with your Twitter. Oh, I mean with the Instagram account and it's just a push of a button. And what I found out in my case, let's say I have four accounts, four uh, Instagram accounts set up on my phone, okay? Mm -hmm. And whenever I set up, um, I add a Facebook account to my Instagram account through my phone, it stays on one single account. So let's say I have my personal account, right? And I want to post a picture. And if I do a share, it's not going to share it on my personal account. It's going to share it on my business page, Facebook. Mm -hmm. Basically, I think it's a problem with Instagram that they don't, allow you to pair up a very specific Instagram account to a very specific Facebook account through your phone. But I use if this than that to kind of solve solve this for me and it saves me so much time. Yeah, I can I can imagine. And uh, that's the if this and that is kind of the personal way of uh, doing marketing and automation on that level. You could mm -hmm. check out also uh, Zapier, which allows you to build very uh, very long automations connecting many systems. Mm -hmm. And are you ever in doubt about these uh, systems and these, these services? Have you have they ever failed you? <laughs> uh, but I've been using if they done that for uh, two years now and uh, mm -hmm. it never really failed me. When it failed me, it was because I didn't set up the, the recipe as they call it properly. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning, it's all uh, you're gonna you're gonna do some try and miss. So for instance, I, uh, I had planned for my, my Instagram to post on Facebook, but uh, it only posted the link at the beginning. So yeah, it's really about finding the right recipe for you. And uh, also something very, really interesting is that you can connect the buffer or uh, other tools like that, that can uh, publish at the best time for your audience. So you don't have to, uh, so if you post your Instagram picture, for instance, at uh, 11 in the, in the night, mm -hmm. your post on the Facebook and Twitter could go, uh, could go on the next day at uh, the perfect time. So you, it really improves uh, your reach. Yeah, that's actually very interesting. Yeah, but then once again, uh, you're mentioning something that I think a lot of people, especially beginners in in marketing, especially online marketing, aren't very well aware of, mm -hmm. is that you need to find the best time for where your audience hangs out, where and what they do and when. Uh, for instance, on one of my Instagram accounts, which is like about motorcycles, right? Nothing crazy. <laughs> I've noticed that most of my most of the likes that I get to my pictures, most of the comments, is when I post between like seven in the morning and eleven in the morning on weekdays. Interesting. Yeah, that's one of the accounts. Other accounts have different times where they get most likes. So this made me think: it's like, wow. So people who like motorcycles and who look at motorcycle pictures, it's people who are working at a you know at whatever work job they have. And they just waste their time in the morning instead of getting <laughs> work done. They're looking at pictures of motorcycles. It's like this specific crowd. That's what they do. And sometimes it's mind blowing. You're like, okay, so for them, I should not post in the evening. Then you have like another, like a travel account uh, on Instagram. And those people like it if you post it in the evening, like let's say starting 7 p.m. That's when you get the most activity. And that's something I find really, really crazy. And that's something that if you do figure out where your audience hangs out and when exactly, and you set up those postings to go out exactly when they're there, that's like that's when you get the most results from 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 your social media efforts. Mm, that's a secret. At Tilo Pages, I work on an, uh, an app called Shopwise, which is uh, an app that features deals and flyers from uh, retailers in Canada, and our mm. uh, target user are. They basically stay at home moms who like to, uh, to, to save money. And uh, so it's, I can imagine it's a very different crowd from yours that you just described. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And I see even that, okay, stay at home moms, you would think, okay, they stay at home. They're 
free the whole day, but it's not true. They are not free the whole day. They have things to do. And I'm sure most of them do things in a very similar way. And they're like off time when they're just like, you know, sitting browsing internet is also around the same time of the day for most of them. Not all, but for most. Mm -hmm. Right. You you also see some different levels of uh, tech savviness. Some are more comfortable with Facebook, some uh, Pinterest, Instagram. So that's uh, that's always about testing and finding what works best with your crowd and, uh, and product in the end. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one. And uh, tell us about your very specific uh, event. Um, have you have you noticed one of the social media channels being a lot more used by your targeted audience than the other? Mm -hmm. Uh, for event like plus e-commerce, uh, we see a yeah. huge difference in uh, in between events and at events social media. So in between events, our crowd is more on LinkedIn and uh, on Facebook. That's why we uh, heavily promote. So sometimes we do a boosted post on Facebook and have like, a, I don't know, the max must have been like 80, 80, uh, 80 likes, which is not that much, but uh, we don't put that much money into it. And yeah. uh, and also during the event, people in uh, especially in ecom they tweet like crazy. So we've uh -huh. hit uh, Canada's top chart uh, on Twitter with our hashtag once. Uh, so it's very different, uh, interesting to see how people use different social media at, uh, at specific times. For instance, we were thinking of leveraging uh, Snapchat as a social media because in the event I see many young people uh, Snapchatting. So we could maybe buy a kind of a layer with our logo on it. So yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's actually very interesting, and um, I think this is when you also see the difference of uh, appropriate social network. Because I know a lot of people don't get Twitter; they don't like Twitter. Mm -hmm. They say Twitter is useless. <laughs> but I've noticed too at events such as yours, a lot of people are using Twitter not be much before or after the event, but during the event. Mm -hmm. This is when you get your, you know. This is when you get to read people's emotions, reactions, uh, opinions, thoughts, and whatever. I don't know why, but I've noticed that, as you just mentioned, during the event, everybody's on Twitter. I have a few ideas on why. Um, so, on, as I said, on social media, we have someone during the event uh, always on on the social media to uh, to post about the presentations, also to uh, to mention and uh, and reply to people, and especially specifically on Twitter. People uh, they come to events to network to. Uh, to hear inter interesting things they want to share. And if you engage with them, they, they kind of want to have a conversation about uh, what the speaker is saying. And uh, also it's a good way to gather questions for uh, the end of your, your presentations. So as I said, uh, anti at post commerce we do 20 minute presentation and uh, about 10 minutes Q and A. And sometimes you'll have a blank in the audience for the questions. And uh, some people are too shy and ask the questions via Twitter. So we have to mm -hmm. ask them for the for for the the people, but uh, I find it really interesting indeed. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so uh, I have a next question here once again about the events. What do you think, or what was in your opinion or in your experience, the hardest thing or the hardest part about setting up an event, a local event? Hmm. Good question. I, I thought you were going to say everything. <laughs> That's kind of everything. That's true. But I talked about it a bit earlier, but it's uh, it's finding a speaker and venue. Then uh, mm -hmm. at our stage at NTI Commerce, it's pretty easy to sell our tickets. We have our website with a, with an e-commerce solution to sell them. People know us, et cetera. But uh, I remember when I joined in the 2014, I think, Mm -hmm. uh, we're struggling to, to fill a 60 people room and now it's, uh, it's really easy to fill a 200 people room and even, uh, even more. So yeah, the, every, uh, every event has its challenge. For instance, the, the last event was our, uh, 30th edition and, uh, 15 minutes maybe be, uh, before people came in the room, we had to change all the room set up. The, the projectors, the chairs, the sound, the mics, oh, wow. because, uh, because the speaker was not comfortable f speaking the in that uh, that way and uh, in the end it made a lot of sense and uh, we did it so you can never predict uh, how it go during the event that's always an unknown mm -hmm. you can prepare what i learned is that you can prepare all you want before the before the event have a program have volunteers but uh, you'll always have something mm -hmm. <laughs> that's crazy you have to be ready to uh, improvise and then switch up and change yeah, things around that's the fun of it 
Yeah. And I uh, see like for for the podcast it's a bit similar to events I guess um as in finding people to be on the podcast and finding speakers for the event as you said it's it's quite difficult. Uh, sometimes it's and it's not just getting people on it's not just having the people agree to be on your event but you have to make sure you find someone kind of appropriate for your event and someone who you think would be able to give out inter- interesting content because that's in the end that's what it's all about that's why people want to come to your event because they want to hear and you know learn interesting content that that's what it's all about in the end mm-hmm. I find podcasting and uh, event planning is similar in many ways. You have to find speakers. You have to to make sure to find the right speakers that reach your audience. And uh, you also want to influence your audience a bit so that it uh, it reflects what you what you want for your podcast or event. And it's also also like uh, you you plan for weeks beforehand, and it's uh, it's just a one time one one two hour, and uh, that's it. So it's yeah, very intense. True. <laughs> That's true. All right, Ambro. So uh, you just shared a lot of a lot of tips on the subject, and you told us how amazing uh, events, local events, could be. And someone listening to this podcast say, "You know what? I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do a local event from uh, you know for for my brand to grow my brand and to get more uh, awareness about my company or about our business. What we do, we want to do a local event. What would be your like number one?" tip your most important advice to someone setting up the event for the very first time i'd say stay stay simple it's always better to have a well functioning maybe one speaker event that lasts one hour and have the right people come then have uh, i often see events with uh, four five six uh, speakers that were not chosen carefully and that uh, the people can relate to and uh, that's what it's all about in the end people want to come to events and uh begin to apply what they learned uh, the next day at work or uh, whatever uh, whatever they're doing with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, I guess. And I think if you're keeping it simple, especially for your first event, it just will make things so much easier on you. And there's, I think, a lot less chance of screwing up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, by now, you know, I'm a, a testing uh, advocate. And so it's the same for events. You can test one event and see how it goes if you have the, the feedback you want. If, mm-hmm. uh, if you have it, you can stick to it. And uh, if not, you can switch ways. That's what we did with our, uh, our training event in last September. It worked, mm-hmm. but we needed time to structure and uh, do more of those. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And what, uh, in your opinion, is the future of MTL Plus e-commerce and your involvement in it? What do you think is... Uh, gonna happen in the next let's say year or the next five years so an interesting question so the founder of mtl commerce now lives in uh, in new york so we might we might want to get abroad for uh, for our event uh we're open to uh, to partnerships we have we have partnership with uh, people in e-commerce in montreal we started speaking with people in vancouver toronto so since we know we have a a good working recipe and that we're independent from a, from a particular company uh, mm-hmm. one could well see uh, that will uh, will expand uh, soon. That's why we took the, the summer off. We, do, we, do, we won't do any events in July and August, but we'll be back in, uh, in September with a, a more structured team and, uh, and events. And so hopefully if uh, wherever you live in North America, you have a NYC plus e-commerce, uh, Vancouver plus e-commerce. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. I would like to see that that grow all over North America and maybe all over the world eventually. Uh, but I'm sure there will be a lot of effort and a lot of time to get there. Oh yeah. And do you think you might go into that full time at some point, doing just that? I don't know. Uh, we kind of had have had a deal with the the team that would would keep a full time job and uh, run that on the side. But uh, if it makes sense for me at one point, uh, why not? Mm-hmm. So it is a possibility at at some point, maybe who knows. At some point, depending on the the size it uh, it takes and uh, everything. Uh huh. All right. Awesome. And uh, I had another question about the very specific event that you're doing, MTL Plus e commerce. Mm-hmm. Why why e commerce? Why concentrate? Why did you choose that topic? Because you said at the beginning, if you're planning an event, you have to choose the topic of your event, and that that's what you should stick to. So in your case, why e commerce? So I wasn't there when uh, MTL Plus e commerce started in uh, 2012, 
But uh, mm-hmm. I know there was a real need of this uh, this topic in uh, in the in Montreal crowd. So it's a bit like uh, like uh, I know you have you've done some podcasts about finding niche websites, uh, niches you, you niche you can get into. It was kind of the same. There was a real lack of e-commerce. It was all new. Everybody was talking about it. And uh, it's a bit the same with the same with the growth growth hacking now. I see some people trying to do some event to start something, and um, so once you have a topic, e-commerce is pretty broad for us. We have uh, people who are really in e-commerce, all the services you can have around that. So agencies, uh, people who uh, who help people build e-commerce websites, also uh, internet advertising. So a lot of what your audience uh, is about. Mm-hmm. So from what I learned during those, those events and even the, the events organized at my business school uh, previously is that you have to, to pick a topic that's not too, uh, too niche, but not too broad either. So you can attract the, the best people in your, ni- in your, uh, in your niche or uh, industry and, uh, and really make a value added event. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I agree with you totally, 100% that e-commerce is, well, I mean, I don't need to agree with you. Everybody knows that e-commerce <laughs> is huge and it's only growing, right? Yeah. And it, it only makes sense to have more of, of these events because I know that I was involved in some uh, marketing meetups back, back in, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago in Montreal. And it was so like underground and so small and like, it would be like five, six people attending that. It even it wasn't an event. It was a it was a meetup.com. So we would like meet up at a coffee shop. Okay. And there was like five people talking about um, online marketing and let's say Facebook advertising. While there was like there were events with 300, 400, 500 people going on, people talking about marketing, but it was really like outdated. And it's like, oh, should you like? Should you get your company into the into the yellow pages actual physical book? Mm-hmm. You know, should you make a website? Not how to do a website, but like should you make a website? And they had people talking against it and saying, no, websites are useless and it's not gonna give you any more business. Uh, because I <laughs> attended one of those events and I was like, <laughs> seriously, like it's we're living in 2010. What like why are you talking about? TV ads and stuff like that. We should be talking about internet, about what's happening now. And that's how I came across like some of the very small meetups back in the day. And there was none, there, like there wasn't anything like MTL plus e-commerce back then, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it's it's for me it's very interesting interesting to see a local event on on these subjects. It's it has like it was needed a long time ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, MTL plus e-commerce and many meetups began in a very small ways. For instance, uh, I remember the first one was uh, was held in a bar in uh, downtown Montreal, and was mainly with uh, with developers who were struggling with uh, building e-commerce websites. Mm-hmm. And so um, now it's more uh, senior e-commerce directors and people in marketing. But uh, yeah, it really evolves a lot. Uh, you see, in three four years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. That well, it has to evolve. Yeah. that's that's kind of the point of it all. And have you thought of and- uh, hosting uh, maybe a extra paycheck event in Montreal or wherever you're traveling. It'd be nice to, to meet your crowd out there. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I thought at some point of making an event, not not the extra paycheck related, but it's more of a um, very like a basic crash course on, on earning money using the internet. So basically what I find hard about that is that I would like to give like a big outline of things like, well, here are the ways you could monetize online. You know, mm-hmm. you could do affiliate marketing. You could do your own products. You could offer uh, courses. You could be um, a freelancer. You could build websites because there's like million things you could do online to make money. But so for me, the hard part about even setting up such an event or like, I mean, thinking of setting up, it's like, should it be more a niche event as in how to make money? as a freelancer programmer or coder Mm -hmm. or basic how to make money online which is like a huge difference right yeah and the the crowd in both cases would be really really different and my problem is if i would make it very like uh, like big generic like this just like basic ideas like 20 ideas on what you can do online to earn uh, an income would would that attract people because it's really you know it's like everywhere. It's not one subject. It's everywhere. And I'm like, I'm not sure if people would attend that kind of thing. Okay. Well, maybe uh, since you have this credibility with your podcast, it uh, 
it would be worth a try. But uh, yeah. Maybe I'll have to think about it. <laughs> so, we can help you. Thanks. Th- thanks for reminding me. <laughs> All right. So we're going to be ending this podcast. Thanks for uh, so much information about the events. And uh, could you share some ways for people to maybe find out more about MTL Plus e-commerce and find out more about you and maybe how they could get in touch with you? Sure. So my personal Twitter account is uh, at Ambroise Debray. My website it, uh, is uh, ambroisedebray.com. By the way, I have a... Uh, I have a specific toolbox that uh, features some uh, tools I mentioned, like if this, then that, buffer and stuff like that. And also I have an extensive post on uh, even growth hacking. Uh, if you want to find MTL plus e-commerce, you can find us at mtlecommerce.com or at uh, mtl underscore e-commerce on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And for those who don't want to go to the show notes page, uh, the website is A-M-B-R-O-I-S-E-D-E-B-R-E-T dot com. That's exactly um, that's your blog, right? That's my blog. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, So, yeah, go check it out if you're more interested in in finding out more about growth hacking and setting up events and pretty much. Marketing and I guess a lot of those kind of things. Exactly. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll add all the links in the show notes page. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for sharing your insights, your experiences, and your tips. Thank you for having me. And don't hesitate to reach out if you need some help with your events. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Extra Paycheck Podcast. As usual, I will be putting up a show notes page at extrapodcast.com slash 67. This is where you will be able to find some show notes on today's episode, to find some links and resources that we mentioned, as well as uh, find out a way to get in touch with this week's guest. Also, head over to extrapodcast.com slash iTunes in order to subscribe to the show, leave a review and a rating, and this will help the show tremendously. Thank you so much for tuning in once again, and I'll talk to you next Monday.